The maker of Lucky Strike and Dunhill Cigarettes is taking a $31.5 billion hit after it wrote down the value of many of its U.S. cigarette brands. British American Tobacco is pointing to economic challenges in the U.S., like inflation-weary consumers who are downgrading to cheaper brands, as well as the rise of illicit disposable vapes. But the company is also pointing to ever stricter regulation and more awareness about tobacco products' negative health benefits. BAT has also said it intends to generate 50% of its revenues from, quote, non-combustible products by the year 2035. Joining us now for more is Ray Mail, a research analyst at Panium Gordon, who focuses on the tobacco industry. Welcome to the program, Ray. BAT has written down 31 billion or so dollars on its U.S. cigarettes brands. Tell us why now. Well, first thing to say is this is an accounting change rather than necessarily anything else. Historically, brands have never been on balance sheets unless you've bought them. The company bought Reynolds American earlier uh, and capitalized values on its brands, which it thought had an indefinite life. It has now chosen 30 years as being a useful life, according to the accountants, rather than to anything else. And therefore, it has to write down the value. Whether 30 years is right or wrong, it could have been 25, it could have been 35. And that would have had a difference on the amount that was actually written off. It is non-cash. Does it tell you anything necessarily about the industry 30 years from now? I don't think so. Uh, but is it, it is a big number, though. Uh, um, how serious is it then for British American? Or is it serious at all? It is certainly eye-catching. And certainly on the day when it was announced, then it was the one number that most people picked up on. Um, does it mean anything for immediate profits? Does it mean anything for cash flows? Does it mean anything for the dividend? Absolutely not. Uh, this is a view of accountants that maybe in 30 years' time there'll be no value to some of the brands which the company has. But equally, when I first ever looked at the sector more than 30 years ago, everyone told me there'd be no smokers by now. 30 years on, there's more. The industry mm. profit pool is actually bigger than it was 30 years ago. So I think in these things, there's an accounting side of it all, and then there's a practical side of it. The number of people smoking is at an all-time high, according to the medical journal The Lancet a couple of years ago. How does this square with BAT's write-down, then? Well, it all depends on which markets you're looking at. Obviously, when people talk about smoking being in decline, people tend to look at percentages of population. And therefore, in many markets, then yes, the percentage of the population has declined. However, because there's more people in the world, then actually a smaller percentage of a bigger number doesn't necessarily mean fewer smokers globally. Mm -hmm. Where those smokers are does change. In the US, then we are at a point where the number of smokers is gently declining. But if we look across the world more generally, take markets like Indonesia, across Africa, even Latin America, then actually the number of smokers is not declining in the same way, albeit percentages will be. And I think that's one of the key things which people normally miss. You're touching on an interesting point there, because for many in the West, smoking cigarettes doesn't bode well with the idea of a healthy and sustainable lifestyle, whereas in emerging economies, smoking cigarettes still is widespread, despite government's uh, initiatives to fight the habit. How important are these markets then? Well, emerging markets have been more than half the industry's volumes and profits for, for decades now. And I think the idea that it's still only an emerging market I mean, is, is probably a little bit, little bit behind the times. Um, emerging markets are important. Does that mean that they're easier to sell into? Are there, you know, all of these markets still have regulation. They all still have graphic health warnings. They all have pictorial health warnings. This is not as though going to emerging markets is in some way some kind of free for all. This is a heavily regulated business. But attitudes towards smoking globally aren't necessarily the same as the attitudes that we're used to in Western Europe or in the US. Now, BAT and its competitor, Philip Morris, have marketed themselves as moving towards a, quote, smoke-free future, while also being among the biggest sellers of cigarettes worldwide. Do you think it's right to be cynical about their claims? No. I mean, both companies have invested an absolute fortune of shareholders' funds over a long period of time. And to be fair, the industry has been pursuing the idea of a safer cigarette, a safer way of delivering nicotine for decades. I mean, the, the search for the safer cigarette started in the 1950s. 
all we're seeing now is a technology enabled way of, of looking at that, whether it be vaping or heat not burn or modern oral. So no, it's not right to be cynical. These companies are trying. However, I do think that it's important that if smokers do choose to smoke, then they should also be supported by the industry to whom they've been so loyal for such a long time. It is a personal choice after all. Uh, and of course, they've been seeing uh, the success that uh, vaping uh, has been having uh, compared to regular cigarettes. Now, BAT has also called for, quote, tougher rules on vapes, despite these being a key segment uh, for the company as smoking declines. What's the business sense in that decision for them? Well, vaping started with enthusiasts. It's been maintained by enthusiasts and every new product development really has been led by consumers much more than by manufacturers. The problem that many of the companies that are in the listed sector deal with is that much of the growth most recently has been in disposable vaping product, all of which has come from China. Now, whether that's been sold legally or illegally, the fact is that it's a, a new source of product. It isn't as heavily regulated or hasn't been as heavily regulated, and therefore it has left an unlevel playing field. Now, should vaping products be available to anyone under 18? Absolutely not. But if they are going to be available, then they should be on a same regulatory basis for all players. I think that's really the point that the companies are trying to make. Hmm. And as you mentioned, this uh, the, the, this age requirement there, it is quite easy to imagine a future where governments become stricter and stricter with vaping as they have for smoking. Uh, what then for companies like BAT and Philip Morris? Well, I think there's a, there's a bigger question for society, much more than just taking a very liberal view of these things. Uh, the fact is that nicotine as as a product has been in demand by humankind for, centuries, well, well, for millennia. Um, and therefore, the idea that prohibition would in some way stop anyone from ever seeking nicotine, I think, is wrong. And therefore, we all have to deal with the idea that actually, if you're not going to have a properly regulated market supplied by proper companies, then we'll get illicit trade instead. All you've got to do is look at the situation of crime in Australia or New Zealand to see what happens when prohibition goes wrong. Um, and there, there are major issues already. Obviously, the UK has sought uh, or is seeking to introduce prohibition by way of age. And I think that's, that's wrong-headed. I think that will just lead to illicit trade. And I don't think it will stop the problem of underage access to product. A recent report by the World Health Organization accuses tobacco companies of interfering in public health policy. They've lobbied to delay tobacco control laws and against plain packaging on cigarettes. Isn't that hypercritical while marketing themselves as wanting to reduce cigarette smoking? It's a common complaint from the World Health Organization, but there isn't a single piece of legislation with respect to tobacco, which the tobacco industry has ever successfully fought against. We have plain packaging, we have graphic health warnings, we've got ever tighter regulation, we've had an increasing age of point of sale. All of these things have come through. And so the idea that big tobacco in some way has been fighting against it doesn't really get supported by the evidence of what's actually happened. Now, cannabis is now legal in places like Canada, South Africa, and a number of uh, states in the US, and also decriminalized in several other countries with more likely to follow. Yet tobacco companies seem to be keeping far away. Why is that? Well, I, I think the point you touched on, tobacco is a legal product. The position of cannabis has been very different. Um, and even where you have seen liberalization, wherever you have seen decriminalization, there hasn't necessarily been the same impact on the legal size of the market as you might imagine. Canada is an absolute case study. Uh, in Canada, you moved towards legislation some years ago. In actual fact, the legal market has been a fraction of the size that some proponents ever suggested it would be, it ever would be. And in fact, the illegal market continues to prosper. For the tobacco companies, that's just a new regulatory minefield. Um, and to be honest, I just don't see that there's the same volume opportunity either. Ray Mail, research analyst at Pan Muir Gordon. Ray, thank you very much for your thoughts.